Yes, brilliant. Sorry we're a little bit late, Cam followers. Uh, there was just a few little glitches in time zone. Note to self that I need to say 7 p.m. GMT. So Hannah's fault, I apologise. But we are here tonight with the lovely Dr. Duncan Lascelles, who came and spent some time with us back in January, I think it was. Um, and I persuaded him, I persuaded him to come back. So please tell us a little bit about yourself, Duncan, so people can have amazing confidence in your knowledge. Sure. Well, uh, thanks for having me back. I mean, you know, uh, that's validation that I didn't mess up too badly the first time. Um, right. I just want to expand a little bit on something that you kicked off with, the whole reason why we're a few minutes late. Um, the reason is purely my fault. Um, you know, I'm over here in the States and I just made the assumption that everything revolves around United States time. And so when Hannah said, and her team said 7 p.m., I, that's what I put down in my calendar. But um, this is all working out well. So looking it's forward to our looking forward to our discussion. So what did you ask me? Oh, you asked me to tell you a little bit about myself. Sure. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I work at North Carolina State University where I have uh, what's called a regular clinical faculty position. So I spend, proportion. I'm a veterinarian um, and trained as a small animal surgeon. I spend a proportion of my time in the clinic, but the vast majority of my time engaged in research, predominantly clinical research around pain. So what I do is I develop ways to measure pain in predominantly companion animals, cats and dogs. And then I use those methods to determine what works to alleviate pain. And it's sort of an iterative process. So I'll, I'll develop a novel way of measuring the impact of pain. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll be testing that with um, unknown, but also known analgesics. And using the known analgesics, I'll then be able to go back and refine the measurement techniques. So this iterative process goes on um, over over many years until we get uh, you know very accurate, uh, very meaningful measures of the impact of pain. Remember, we we can't actually measure pain in animals directly mm -hmm. because pain is what you describe it as, what you think it is, what is what you feel. So until mm -hmm. um, what's that little cartoon where the dogs have the little transponder that allows them to speak was mm. that a film or something or Ooh, sort of cartoon film somebody will tell us somebody. yeah yeah sure someone will but you know the, you know those cartoon dogs have this little little things on their neck and it allows them to speak like humans well until we get to that stage yeah we're, we're not going to be able to measure pain so we're measuring the impact of pain on activity on um mm. the way movement occurs on the quality of sleep um, you know, you know, facial expression, or it's we we can measure everything, all the dimensions that pain impacts. So yeah. it's a long-winded answer to your question. No, so it's not. But you just That's what I do. Me. That's what I do. You reminded me of how you got into this because you were fascinated about memory, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, you, now that's a good memory. Yes, and yeah. the reason the two are connected, in case anyone's wondering, is that um, pain. The, the pain is because of essentially a memory, a neuronal memory. Um, mm. Input into the system creates this 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 memory of pain, um, and the mechanisms involved, things like long term potentiation, are very similar to those involved in memory. So yes, that's how yeah. I got into the area. Yeah, and I think people forget that as soon as you tell people the story that your pain experience is very influenced by the pain you've experienced before. Right. People say, oh God, I get you. Because if if we didn't have a painful experience or somebody else's painful experience at the dentist, none of us would fear it. Yeah. We have this irrational, oh God, it's gonna be painful at the dentist. Why, why is that? Because Marjorie told me it was. And it's, yeah. it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. The, the film was called Up. It was a cartoon called Up. Okay. All right, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, whoever <laughs> sent that in. Loads of people. Okay. So, we have a list tonight, guys. We have a carefully planned conversation, which we hope is just going to flow. And we're going to try and break a few myths and expand your understanding. So, we're going to start off with a really big myth that bugs me quite a lot, which is that arthritis just comes with aging. We should just accept it. It's an old dog's disease. It's just what they get. You know, stop fighting it, Hannah you know, accept it. What do you think about that? 
Well, it's not quite correct because in dogs, arthritis is actually a young dog disease. Mm. Um, and so here's a, 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 a little bit of the, the reasoning behind that statement. So in dogs, so in, in, maybe I'll start with humans. In, in humans, arthritis, osteoarthritis is an age-related disease. So the older you get, the more likely you are to have osteoarthritis. Um, the older you get, the worse that's going to be. And then superimposed on that is how you live your life, you know, how mm -hmm. your, your lifestyle. If you're a skier, you're probably more likely to get osteoarthritis. If you're a bad skier like my brother, you're even more likely to get osteoarthritis, you know, and it's going to be a lot worse. So it's, it's an age-related disease. And so we know that in humans. Um, and so we transpose that to dogs. However, in dogs, the majority of arthritis is driven, it's initiated by developmental disease. And developmental mm -hmm. disease is there, is present in puppies. And we're really mm -hmm. good at diagnosing that and talking about it, hip dysplasia, um, elbow dysplasia, patellar luxation. So we can have those conversations, we're good at diagnosing it, but what we miss is the fact that once we've made a diagnosis of developmental disease, we have made a diagnosis of arthritis because it has started so that's the first thing. So arthritis is actually a young dog disease. Then people might say, oh, yeah, but it's not a problem until they're older. Well, it's a problem when we care to pay attention. So when your dog can't get up, when it can't go upstairs and when it can't get into the car anymore, that's when we pay attention. It's kind of an emergency. And all of us and we're all we're all guilty to a greater or lesser extent we all of us tend to ignore the more subtle signs of dogs coping of mm. adapting how they move adapting their lifestyles to cope with the joint pain so mm. it's only an old dog disease because we think it's an old dog disease and we only pay attention when it's an emergency mm. it's actually a young dog disease and there are plenty of signs in young dogs and we need to be paying attention earlier. And then I'll just, just, just one, one other aspect. One of the reasons why we don't want to pay attention it earlier is because we feel it's a, a depressing thing to talk about arthritis in a young dog. And, you know, someone's gonna tell us your dog needs, your puppy, your wonderful puppy that you're so proud of needs to be on medication for the rest of its life. Neither of those two things should be true. Yes, and that's gonna be on our list. So stay tuned, people. I think, um, I was going to add to that exactly those things is that people are quite in fear of an early diagnosis for the commitment, be it a physical, a financial, an emotional commitment. And they they do to bury their head in the sand. And I've experienced it so many times where people go into a denial state because it feels hard work and it and it bursts the bubble of what they expected they were going to do with their dog. And that's one. But one thing that I really want to plant a challenging seed for people is that when you consider that we use preventative health care with vaccines and wormings and flea treatments and things like this, we should have a more of a preventative approach to this disease because it's common, isn't it, Duncan? And it's not like we're going to avoid it when you really look at the figures. So establishing a universal kind of preventative mindset to it is surely the right direction or would you disagree no i totally agree and it is common um the best evidence would suggest that about 40 percent of all dogs mm. have osteoarthritis associated pain mm. present and Where did you know, get 40? where's you got 40 from because i've just been quoting you 35 percent because i've i read your article where it was in okay so 37 percent. let's split the difference 37 I, I love it. okay that's i'm rounding up i'm rounding up to 40. i love it My I bad. My, and I, because... we could we could round down to 35 that's absolutely no fine. no i don't we, we go 40 because i think over time as we get better and better at detecting the early signs the behavioral changes the postural changes we're going to start going actually you know it's yeah. worth and actually, we and you know, the, one of the reasons for 40 is we're, we're currently doing an epidemiological study of young dogs, uh, young dogs up to the ages of four years of age, and we're looking at about 40 percent. Yeah, of dogs with measurable, like you know, a veterinarian evaluates the dogs, and there is osteoarthritis and there is pain, so uh, with that, so it's a it's an extreme, it's probably 
the most common disease of dogs. It so, is. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, so let's just um, tantalize the, the followers that what are the common things that you're picking up in your epidemiological study of dogs under the age of four that have OA? What kind of features come up every time, clinical signs that you go, Ooh. Right, um, that's a great question. And I think if you put aside our veterinarian evaluation where we can detect joint pain, we can detect muscle atrophy, which means you know, loss of muscle due to yeah. joint pain and limbs not being used. Predominantly what we're seeing are behavioral adaptations in movement that helps these dogs cope with joint pain. So mm -hmm. let me just, you know, talk talk about one thing. Um, if I if I say the butt wiggle, we all know what that is in a dog, all right? Now, there are two butt wiggles. There's the butt wiggle when you arrive home and the whole back end of the dog is going from side to side and the front end's going the opposite direction. I mean, that's just a happy, a happy, dog wiggle okay but the other butt wiggle and the one we're interested in talking about here is when dogs are walking and you see that shift of the butt from side to side okay yeah. now that is actually an adaptation to help them cope with hip pain and how you explain that is that i'm going to stand, stand up here so how you explain that can you see me still yeah i can see you yeah which this way okay so um when you walk you flex and extend your hip joint yeah okay but if it's painful and you want to move forward you have to limit the movement of the hip joint so the way to do it is if i come face on instead of flexing and extending my hip joints is i'm going to throw my my pelvis round to one side throw it to the other and then again and then again mm -hmm. And so you can imagine, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, do a butt wiggle here, but um, that essentially that's what you end up with with a dog. Okay, so it doesn't yeah. want to flex and extend its hip joints, so it shifts its its back end from one side to the other, so it can effect forward motion without flexing and extending its hip joints. So it's limiting pain, which is present, and it has this adaptation. And so, so what do you it, think about people that wait for lameness? Because that's a well, well I, I guess the question is, what is lameness? The true definition of lameness is a mobility impairment, which mm -hmm. is the butt wiggle. The colloquial interpretation of lameness and one which the rent profession perpetuates erroneously is that lameness is, is, is really a word to describe a limb that's not being used. Yeah, that's that's encompassed by the word lameness, but lameness is just uh, abnormal mobility. Um, once, but once you get down to you know not using a limb properly, that's that's pretty serious. Yes, yes. You know, and but earlier on, and this is what in in these young dogs we see the butt wiggle, we see rounded backs because of weight being tipped forward off painful hind limbs. Um, we you know we see short steps at the front. Um, these are these are adaptations to help them cope with joint pain and yeah. while we're talking about it do you know of any libraries or video clips because one thing that we would love to do is compose a library of video clips so people can actually understand about gait and start to get an eye in for it because I think um, well I was with a friend who I've told him his dog is moving badly and when you get an eye for it you can just see it can't you right. you're driving yes. down there's one there's one there's one yeah <laughs> but he cannot see it at all and it would be lovely to be able to send people to a, a library of clips that point out abnormalities that sh could indicate pain and just to be fair to owners and professionals we've got such breed variation you know, you take a, a pug through to a Great Dane, how different morphologically they are. It's not surprising that we find this really challenging, is it? I think that's a great idea. Let's, let's do, do it. it. Yes. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> we, might, we, we might need to reach out to your, um, your yes. listeners, yes. your team, your followers, yes. Um, for, for some help with this. But I think that's, that's, that's a great idea because it is very visual. And it is very visual. When, when you see it, and I think the breed specificity thing is important, when you see it, 
um, in a video, then you can see it in your own pet. Yep. Mm. Yeah. So I was talking to my lovely friend, Lindsay, um, years and years ago, and she actually found it distressing to learn how to do it because she suddenly realized how big the problem is. And I think um, I think that is quite a, a truth. Talking about the figures, the percentages that we're seeing yep. in, when you have your eyes open to postural adaption, gait adaption, behavioral adaption because of pain, you just see it everywhere. And then people start labeling you as being obsessed about pain. You're like, no, no, I'm not obsessed. It's just, it's really there. There's a lot. <laughs> it, yes, it's really common. And I think, you know, we need to switch this conversation fairly soon to the positive aspects because yes. it's, it's very common. It's a disease that's associated with pain. Um, it's, you know, untreated, it's going to get worse over time. That's, that's all pretty depressing. But there's a reason for talking about identifying it in young dogs, because we can then improve their future and yes. not end up with dogs that just, just, just cannot or won't get up because of pain. Yeah. I think it's a brilliant idea. So that, why don't we jump to the next one? Because then it helps people. It's all about the bony deposition and the pain is from grating of bone. Right. What do you think about that belief? Bone on bone grating is where the pain comes from. Well, I, I, um, you know, my personal view is I don't think that's true. Um, they're so, you know, joints, joints are complex. And for sure, in some joints, once there's a dramatic loss of cartilage, there is going to be bone on bone contact. Um, and the, you know, those two surfaces shouldn't normally be moving together. And so that's going to create more tissue damage and contribute to pain. But Pain is coming from all components of the joint. Pain is present early on when arthritis starts um, and there's still a lot of cartilage left and there is no bone on bone contact. So pain is coming from the, the, the pro-inflammatory mediators. Even though osteoarthritis is not that inflammatory, it's coming from there's the, that low level of pro-inflammatory mediators. It's coming from sensitized nerves in the synovium, the joint capsule, the subchondral bone. Um, all of the tissues that comprise the joint, those nerves become sensitized. They activate more easily. That's where the pain is coming from, from the periphery. Then if you leave, if you leave that pain untreated, changes occur in the spinal cord that facilitate, mm -hmm. amplify, and perpetuate pain. And then at some point, um, pain is facilitated by a dysfunction of the body's own ability to control pain, the so-called mm -hmm. descending endogenous analgesic system. So what I've just described is the fact that um, as, as osteoarthritis progresses in time, where pain is left untreated for a period of time, the mechanisms driving pain are not just related to the whole joint, but to changes in the spinal cord, changes in the in the body's ability to control pain itself so it becomes more and more complex which is why the longer it's left the more difficult it is to more treat difficult. but and the pain is, is you can't predict how what time frame no okay? so some dogs can have very little change and they've got a joint that's still got good range of motion and there's very little radiographic change but oh my god they have had the bad card yeah. handed to them yes. they yeah. are and sensitized I think it's magnified and it's quite sad because I know different to what I did before. So I've been a vet for nearly 19 years and I am a, a late developer. I didn't really get into pain and understanding it until about 11, 12 years in. Right. And I look at my understanding previously and I really had no concept and I, I, I feel guilty. I think Cam's driven a bit by guilt that I would have x-rayed dogs and gone, well, there's nothing there. So it's, it's, it's nothing, let's just move forward. Or I would have referred it for a neurology problem. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, think I, that, I think that comes, yeah, it comes back to where we started with, you know, if you, if you describe arthritis pain as only being bone on bone, then that leads to the assumption that, okay, you're only gonna get pain when things are really bad. Pain yeah. is present from an early stage um, when there's still a lot of cartilage left. So yeah, that, that is not a great descriptor. No, good, okay, so, which is fantastic. Once they have it, nothing can be done. So we're not, 
we're, we're, we're kind of looking at this massive spectrum of arthritis now, guys. So we're not looking at just the Lord of the Rings <laughs> joints that don't move. We're looking at huge range of joints um, with function and still joint health, if that makes sense. Um, once they have it, nothing can be done. So I don't know how we're going to tackle this because there is a very broad range of grades of arthritis. And it could be argued in grade five, end stage, terminal, you know, they don't move anymore. Actually, they're not that painful anymore because they don't really move anymore. And they've kind of, we've got a big topic here. What, what's your feeling sure. once they have it, nothing can be done? Well, again, I, I don't think that's true. And I think this is, you know, what I was mentioning earlier. We need to change the tone of the conversation, not just between us, but mm. we need to change the tone of the conversation that we have about uh, osteoarthritis. The earlier we diagnose it, the more we can do. We can alter the future in a positive way. Mm. And there are a lot of presentations of osteoarthritis, a lot of um, uh, stages, degrees of severity. But if we think of, if we talk about two basic areas, one is pain and the other is the disease itself. Mm. Pain, the earlier we treat it, the more aggressively and effectively we, we, we treat it, we can prevent that deterioration that produces more and more pain. That's, that's a good thing, mm. okay? And if we treat early, we can have very long lasting effects. For the disease, we can um, we, the, there are a few things that we believe can slow the progression of the disease. And although the, those two, disease and pain, are not closely related, without disease, there wouldn't be any pain. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, and so, so one of probably pain, one of the disease wouldn't really be a problem. Right. Yes. No, that's a really good Sorry, point. <laughs> no, that's right. And you know, and I'm, I, I keep talking to people about this. It's it's okay. Are you talking about the disease of osteoarthritis or osteoarthritis pain? Because yeah. the disease arguably is of no interest until it's associated with pain. But yeah, it would be you know, um, it makes sense to decrease the burden of disease. And the most effective way to do that is through calorie restriction. And I I would like to talk about that for, for just a few minutes. Go for it. Yeah. So. Yeah. We all, and it's particularly in, in the Western world and maybe particularly in the United States, everyone wants a pill, a tablet, and ideally some sort of supplement, nutritional supplement to cure disease, to prevent disease. The reality is there is nothing in the way of supplements that will decrease the progression of disease mm. for osteoarthritis. The, the most effective way of decreasing the burden of disease is lifelong calorie restriction. Mm. Um, and that needs to be started early on. And you're talking about keeping dogs slim, you know, so mm -hmm. that you can see a waist when you look at them from above, um, that they don't have those extra folds flopping around, um, a fat under the skin, so that in bright sunlight, you know, you can, as they move, you can see their rib cage. We're not mm -hmm. talking about emaciated dogs. We're talking about dogs that, well, how a dog should look normal I know. and people 80 yes they have they have 80 percent of the dogs are obese not just overweight so we've got a new hashtag you're gonna love it oh dog. yes dog what dog or log dog, that's good that's good <laughs> because they just become a log don't they they get no yes. definition between chest and waistline and yes and i actually have to thank luke gal for doing that because he said my dog's a log and i was like oh i love that but um yeah. Do you know what? it's really interesting that you say this because for the last five or seven days we've been doing hashtag coping with COVID again because the UK are in a lockdown right. and we're all pulling our hair out and we're all had our you know socializing and getting out and doing things and having things to look forward to taken away again so coping with COVID is our um, CAM's way of trying to give people tips and advice and generally it's focused on low cost easily accessible interventions that you can put in place today, tonight, tomorrow, whenever, you can get on with it. Now, I did a series of five days in a row about weight control. And I know that um, people were getting bored. People were getting bored because the, the the likes and the follows and the interest was sagging. You know, it was proper good. And I'm going to say thank you to you because I'm not going to let it affect me personally. I'm going to carry on bleating on about weight because it is so important. It is so important. And people seem to get bored of hearing about it. 
Yeah, it, it is. It is desperately important. And you know the 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 way people make a beeline for supplements, hoping that they will alter disease progression, means they actually they do care about it. They you know they care about the idea of disease progression. They they want to decrease disease progression. Well, the way to do that is to keep your dog slim, to feed it less. Wow. And just so just very briefly, there was a, a beautiful study done over 16, 17 years. This is so clinically relevant. Mm -hmm. About 24 dogs in each group for the lifelong Purina study, I think. 24 dogs in each group, um, genetically matched, managed identically, except that one group of these Labrador puppies was fed 25% less than the other group. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then every year, all the joints in the body are radiographed. So now we're just talking about disease. At 10 years of age, 19 out of 24, roughly 24 dogs had hip OA in the control group. The Labradors mm -hmm. ate whatever they wanted to. And they looked like most people's Labradors. Mm -hmm. In the calorie restricted group that were fed 25% less, six out of 24 had radiographic evidence of hip OA. I mean, that is just, I mean, I, I get goose pimples every time I talk about that because that is such a dramatic, incredible Absolutely. reduction in disease and the disease was less severe and not just hip joints but across most of the joints in the body so mm -hmm. that is the key to decreasing disease if we decrease disease prevent disease we're going to prevent the pain associated with it yeah yeah no absolutely and i, I just love the fact that you really put it into practical when you face blunt terms of these people love their dogs and they'll go online and they'll buy supplements and they'll have a, a subscription for 40 50 80 dollars right. a month they must love their dog yep. but there's some inhibition to actually changing lifestyle when i talk about lifestyle i mean don't feed them so much while you're out and i think yes and i think there's there, there are two conflicting things here is one is we we do love our dogs and when they look at the look at look at us with those you know puppy eyes, we we want to do something nice for them. And unfortunately, we we default to throwing them a titbit, giving mm -hmm. them a treat. But then at the other end, it is it is heartbreaking when our older pets can't move, when they're in pain, and we can't treat it effectively. And it is it, it's killing when we then have to euthanize them. Oh, yeah. Because of pain we can't control because they can't move. And if we could just focus on, you know, what we do when they're younger will really decrease those heartbreaking episodes yeah. at the other end. And I think then, I, then I think Dr. we would pay more attention. Yeah. And I think Dr. Nick Cave was saying, you know, if the dog is carrying weight when it's younger, it's going to really likely carry that weight for the rest of its life. So, again, we go back to younger dogs. So people that come on to CAM tend to be quite reactive. You know, they've been told they've got a problem. The vet said, go and check out CAM. So, you know, sadly, we do have the cohort that are more to the end stage. But these people, I am watching them and they're quite passionate about their next dog or their younger dogs. And they, they kind of go, right, now is the time to get it right. I can really influence now. So, yeah, yeah guys. There was an article I read years and years ago, and I don't know if I'll ever find the reference where they did a study looking at the dog's satisfaction on whether having a treat or having time and was there a difference and they found that actually the dogs were as content as happy as satisfied with time the owner's time the owner's attention and i think only we could get that across to owners it doesn't have to involve a treat it's your time it's your eye contact it's your interaction it's what you do with them it's as much fun to them and you can equate that to childcare. You know, if you keep palming yes, with a blooming Kit Kat, your kid's going, Dad, I just really want to, just want to talk, Kit Kat. Yep. Dad, I just like yep. to talk. You just wouldn't do it, would you? Well, you, you'd probably get told off if you did. <laughs> That's great. Can you, if you, if you can dig that out, can you send that to me? If I find it, yeah. Article, I'll, yes. It was years and years ago. I'll see if I can find it. And if any yeah. follower, because there's a lot of behaviorists on here, if you know it, show me where it is, okay? Yeah, I've written it down so I don't forget. Right, moving on. Yes. So we've decided that there is actually quite a lot you can do. I actually just want a tangent. I haven't primed you for this. When we've been doing practice lectures, so Cam will go into vet practices and train the whole team. So we train the receptionist, the nurse, the vets, and then the 
working together. Something that has come up quite a few times is vets not knowing what to do when the dog is so young with OA and they feel almost cornered. The only thing in my arsenal is medication or supplements. I don't know what else to offer. So just take a few minutes and just rattle off a few random ideas of how you can influence a young dog and it's just not meds and supplement focused. Yes, that's very easy because it's, what I, it's honestly what I do every single day. So uh, uh, the first thing to realize is that, um, and I'm gonna talk about medication, but I'm not talking about lifelong medication. So you take a young dog that has signs of OA pain, um, what what you want to do is, or the best approach is to use medication to get rid of the pain. Once the pain is decreased, we can gradually increase exercise, which is gonna do two things. It's gonna help with weight management, because honestly, most of these dogs are overweight. Not all, mm -hmm. but most are overweight. So the exercise is gonna help with weight management. The exercise in and of its own right is gonna produce pain relief. Mm. Okay, so now we modulate the weight, we're increasing the exercise, and we could talk about what sort of exercise in a little bit, don't let me forget that. Um, we increase the exercise, that produces pain relief. The Because of the pain relief, the whole pain sensing system is now reverts to being more healthy, more normal, so we have less pain to treat, we then remove the the drugs, the, the analgesics. Now this process could take three, four, six, eight months, but mm -hmm. my experience is that if you if you do that well, then you you can in most cases take these young dogs off drugs and have them truly um, pain free for many years. Mm -hmm. And so what yeah. you've done is you've kind of nipped it in the bud. You said, okay, let's stop this, let's get the whole system back to normal. Um, and it, it does involve lifestyle changes. You know, there's no, there's no question about that. Lifestyle changes being keeping weight at, a, at, a, at, a, at an optimal level and keeping up moderate exercise. Yeah, and I think this is where we really do have to put a lot of um, onus on physiotherapists. They've been doing this for years and years and years. And as a vet from 10 years ago, if I was in a position in a consult room and I had 10 minutes to advise that owner that I had the intention of giving pain relief, but I wanted to come off of it if they changed the dog's life and they did this exercise differently, blah, 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 I would feel challenged by that. I knew that I, I know that I wouldn't get that across. This is where we can bring in our dis a different discipline, our, our colleagues, our multidisciplinary team and say, look, at this point, I want you to go and speak to my colleague that's really going to make you understand and to create these management plans that we can come off the non-steroidal. Yep. We just need to build that bridge more, I think. No, we do. And um, and the T and we also need to emphasize this is short-term treatment. It's it's a few months. Mm. Okay. And we need to emphasize that that we are all part of that team, you know, the the the, the veterinarian. The, the, the staff in the veterinary practice, the owner, the owner's family, it's a team together doing this. It's not mm. one person telling someone else what to do. It's a team and you know we will monitor it and see how it goes and we'll adapt it as we go along. But this is, this is a treatment plan. And I, I, I use a three plus three. This is a treatment plan for three months. Stick with me for three months. If this doesn't work, we'll go to plan B. I yeah. actually don't know what I don't know what plan B is. I've never, I've never <laughs> needed it. I've never needed it. I've never needed it because plan A wow. always works. It always works. So you know, stick with me for three months. Um, and you you know you have to it you have to acknowledge it's hard work. It's hard work on the owners and the, and the family. And you, and we as veterinarians need to put some effort in. You know, we need to be reaching out to them. We need to have them swing by to the practice or call us up or text us or something, give us you know, give us updates, engage them, keep them, um, keep them on board with this because it, it is not easy. We're asking them to do things that either no one wants to do or things that are difficult. You know, mm. for the first three months, use a drug maybe every day. 
increase the amount of walk, feed their pet less, add in, and we, we should talk about certain certain nutritional supplements. You know, that's that's a lot of work. It is a lot of work, and it's um, I think I think both sides of the consult room table can do better. I won't lie. I think that's sometimes we don't connect this early advice with what can happen if we don't give it. You know, I'd love to do yeah. an with a crystal ball and you've got a healthy dog walking in past the crystal ball one way and coming out as an old debilitated dog the other side and what we can do to, to prevent that um, and also I think owners just really need to be more receptive you know to the advice and as you say get rid of this pill potion lotion thing and think lifestyle can have a huge impact but it's tough because we know this from our own healthcare. in the last five to ten years we've really started to drift away from medicating 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 mm. and start being more what's we're more responsible for ourselves you know you look at the nice guidelines about managing chronic pain it's you've got to be responsible for yourself right. so anyway we can talk about that for ages. so we talked about that now we can move on because that will lead into what you want to talk about nutrition People that believe it's only medication, only supplements or only therapy, and they're very adamant and very powerful in their opinions. And they're, because they're so confident, all you need is a supplement and then you'll be fine. You're like, oh, of course, I totally believe you. Right. What do you think about that? So I think, you know, um, maybe the starting point should be an acknowledgement that um, Pain is complex and there's a lot of redundancy and it is unlikely, in fact, it probably impossible that you will be able to effectively manage pain with one approach. Mm. And whether that's one drug or whether that's one non-drug therapy. And so the most effective way is to use what's called a multimodal approach. Um, and you know, I think sometimes it gets a bit out of, out of control um, in terms of the number of treatments, but a sensible multimodal approach in these young dogs are go is going to be an effective analgesic to get rid of the pain, to allow exercise, that's another treatment, increased mm -hmm. exercise, that's gonna help with weight modulation, that's another treatment. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I like to add in the omega-3 fatty acids, the fish oils, because they give a background um, you know, low to moderate degree of, of pain relief. So they're helping with that. So that's a very basic multiple, multi-pronged approach. And then, you know, for later stages, it can get more complex. We start to add in um, uh, targeted physical rehabilitation exercise. We maybe add in some other drugs. We're gonna add in assist devices. You know, it gets it gets more complex, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that complex in, in, in every case. Yeah. But for sure, you want a, a multiple faceted approach. 17 different interventions, 17. I won't lie, I think probably 10 of them weren't actually really doing very much. Right. But um, right. I just, I say that because it's kind of a really strange situation where you've got owners that are, are, are doing everything they can. You know, they, they will be on their iPad late at night, desperately trying to help their dog because they feel vulnerable and they feel that they need to do right. more but quite often they're skirting over the real foundational block interventions that you don't I like that. I like that. Um, I, yeah, I, um, I like that word foundational block. I use tier one as, and I think this is, this is something which as a profession and particularly those of us who talk about it have not been good at. Um, you know, when you go to continue education, you, and it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's across many different diseases. Um, you listen to people talk about treatments. There's a slide for this treatment, a slide for this treatment, a slide for the other treatment, a slide for the next treatment. Um, and so what, what people look at is they think, well, this is just a buffet of options. And no one has any idea which are the foundational ones, which are the ones that are going to be more likely to be beneficial versus those that, ah, you know, really should just be an add-on if you're really trying to get some extra benefit and you've tried the fact you you know you've instigated the foundational treatments so yeah. that, it's that, that's a really important point well i'm going to just take a very very brief opportunity to speak up a new course that we've we've released today today and um one of the things i think is really difficult for vets is we have limited time to try and get so much information across and in our multidisciplinary team, you've mentioned the owner is a member, you know, um, 
the, the, the physiotherapist, the nurse, even reception, they're all members. But so is the dog trainer, and so is the, the kennel assistant where the dog goes for the summer for two weeks, and so is the dog groomer who asks the dog to stand on a table for two hours. And so is the, the dog walker. And all these people are also part of this multidisciplinary team. Because I know that we've had dogs where we've got their pain state in a good level and then they've gone to a groomer and they've seemed to have a massive destabilization, more than likely because they've had to stand still on a table for like two hours. So we've created a course called Cam Advocate. And it's level one and it's on a platform called Teachable. So it's online, it's a modular course and it's available for everybody to start understanding about how to identify pain of arthritis early prevalent how we can all all of us influence it because the foundational approaches can be implemented by anybody so a dog walker could say this dog is overweight i need to help my owners of dog get the dog's weight back down because i know that i have a really good role to play in making this dog's pain state better or the kennel assistant um might be able to say look i know they're away for two weeks this is my chance to get a couple of pounds of this dog and be able to tell them how well the dog's done. So we all have a role to play. So Cam Advocate Level 1, I'll put a little link to it. And I'm I'm going to give it to you for free, Duncan. So there you go. Oh, you thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're doing so much. You're doing so much great stuff, Hannah. It's, 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 oh, it's, no. It's I, really just, good. Just, I just care. I just really care. Right. Let's talk about Omega-3s because I know that everybody's ears are burning for this because you cannot help but be human and want to give something. It's, a, it's just this wish. Buy, give, endorphins in ourselves go off. We feel better about ourselves as humans. What do we know about supplements? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, supplements is a is a massive area because there are thousands of supplements um, which, 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 which we can buy. And I am the first one to admit that Many of those supplements have a lot of potential, but transferring that potential into or realizing that potential when you give a supplement to your pet is where things start to fall apart. apart. For example, just a, a little kind of quick, it's, 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 it's a funny aside, but um, uh, it, it illustrates the point. So mm -hmm. one of my favorite supplements is resveratrol. It's in it's in red wine. Oh. Okay. And resveratrol, you know, if you take resveratrol, if you give enough of it to rodents, they live longer. That's good. Wow. They get less cancer. You can decrease their pain. I mean, it has these incredible effects if you can get enough into a rodent. Yeah. And so, um, you know, here reading those studies, you think resveratrol is good. Okay. Oh, and resveratrol is in red wine. So now I'm gonna make the assumption that red wine is gonna make me live longer and have anti-cancer effects and decrease pain, okay? In, for us, for, in order for us to get the same amount of resveratrol into us from red wine, we would need to drink 40 bottles a day, <laughs> okay? No, and so that, that little funny just illustrates where things go awry. Yeah. If you can get enough curcumin into a yeah. rodent, it is analgesic, but you can't physically feed that much mm -hmm. curcumin to a dog and get it absorbed for it to have those beneficial effects. And so when you see, yeah. you know, when you see a little, a tiny little supplement and it says it has curcumin in it, there just isn't enough to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that explains why I would say for many supplements, there's a lot of potential, but it's not realized because of what we actually end up giving to our pets. The one, the one supplement, um, and it actually, I, I prefer to pull it out from this, this umbrella of supplements that where we, we can measure beneficial effects are with the omega-3 fatty acids, the um, fish oil derived omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and if you, can, if you can add into the diet or have a diet that contains roughly 100 to 200 milligrams per kilogram of omega-3 fatty acids every day, um, that is associated with measurable decreases in pain, measurable the increases. Is that's quite a high level, isn't it? It is. Like, it is. Diarrhea. Exactly. And so it's not for every pet. Mm. Um, you know, in order to get to that level, you've got to go up carefully. And very often, 
it's though that level is better tolerated by feeding one of those so-called joint support diets mm. than adding the supplement into a regular diet so it's you know it's it, it's again it's not it's it's not for everyone but then no treatment is mm. um but it is it is a supplement which has measurable benefits i think this this is a, such a difficult topic like i will be honest i've had to write um presentations for like nurses and vets about supplements and it's the thing that i fear the most yes. i i find it intoxicating i am not trained to critically review it's something that i'm trying to teach myself and i find the sheer quantity of papers out there the sheer amount of information yep. and i find it misleading and distressing if i'm really honest yes um i say that because i want people to realize that it's really really complicated the info that is out there so that's that point second thing i want to say is please know in the cam shop we have no supplements no therapeutic um, medication because we want to be able to to say these things without any bias whatsoever so we wouldn't be able to sit here and really tell you the truth if we were secretly flogging some in the shop you know because <laughs> so we have a really big policy about this so i just want everybody that's listening here to realize that neither of us have any reason to say what we're saying so there isn't a conspiracy theory this is what we know and it seems to be such a contentious topic. If I ever, if I ever challenge anybody, they're like, "Well, no, of course, turmeric's amazing." You know, there's there's a group of two hundred and fifty thousand people, and everybody says it works. So of course, it's amazing. And you're like, "Well, no, it's got like one percent bioavailability." Right. You know, right. Yes. Uh, one kilo sack a day. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, and 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 also, yeah, it's it's incredibly complex and. Uh, the industry is completely unregulated, so anyone can say anything. The way information is presented in the literature, which is what we look at for evidence, is mm. confusing. Um, and people people do like to say, "Hey, here's a here's a paper proving benefit." And when you when you read it, it's it's a cell culture. Mm. And if you sprinkle enough of a supplement on cells and you measure the right things, you see some benefits. And so it's it's that type of work which I'm, which is great work, but it's taken out of context. You mm. know, someone assumes well because you sprinkle curcumin on these cells, and you can measure something that that they produce that that is theoretically a benefit, then curcumin must be good in the whole animal. What we need mm. is we need we need some of these these supplement companies to belly up to the bar, and to do good clinical studies so that we can all understand is there a benefit of. Mm the amount they've decided is appropriate in the whole yeah. live animal. Yeah, and I'm just going to add a bit of an emotional context to this because what is, maybe I'm seeing the other way. Maybe my bias is the other way and I have to be really, really careful about it. But I'll tell you why I can I can get quite um, soapboxy about this. I went to a little old lady's house once. She, had, um, she, she wasn't seeing her vet. Um, she wanted to see somebody independent because she was a bit embarrassed about her dog. Her dog was really quite elderly and she was scared that her vet was going to tell her it needed to be euthanized. So it was quite a motive meeting. And when I asked her what she was giving her dog, she brought out an array, an array of supplements that she was doing a whole pension on. So the quantity of money that she was spending on her, her supplements that she really believed in because they were very persuasive None of them were from any kind of veterinary source. They were all online and they all had amazing labels. Mm. She really believed that her dog was on the best pain relief possible and he wasn't getting any better. And she was scared that she was hitting the end point. And it just broke my heart that, you know, she was being quite misled, really. And if that dog had seen a vet and had gone on to something with an evidence base um, and a non-steroidal, she probably would be in the position she was in. So I'm sorry, that's just my, my perspective on no, I think it's and you know, yeah, that's that that's a really sad story. Um, I've certainly found that people are very married to the idea of supplements, and that's fine. It doesn't bother me if they have the resources, but as long as they're doing those foundational things, as long as they're mm -hmm. doing things that are likely to have benefit, then sure you can add on these these other things. But when you see those situations where people are focused on using uh, therapies that have no evidence and actually we're, we're pretty sure don't work that's sad mm. it really is because the, the ultimate sad. sufferer 
is the pet. It's the dog. Yeah. It is really, it is. You know, it's, it's sad. <sighs> oh, you're going to be really impressed. I've got a guest coming up that you're going to really like. Oh, Michael, yes. caregiver placebo effect. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Great. Great. <laughs> Persuade him. It's going to be a very interesting live. <laughs> Brian McKinnon, Skepfet, talking about caregiver placebo as well. Okay, great. Like, let me let me know effects. when those are. I need to I need to I need to follow you or whatever the the right word is. Yeah, yeah, amazing, yeah. amazing guest like yourself. Right. So we've come up to fifty minutes and we're nearly the end. And um, I think it's lovely to just touch on something that's new out and you're allowed to now talk about, which is really quite exciting. So I want to end on a really positive endpoint. Tell us about the completely new approach of monoclonal antibodies. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, this, this is exciting. So to put this in context, um, this is exciting both on the human side and the veterinary medicine side. Um, but what I'm talking about is a new drug therapy it's a biologic so that that's the space i'm talking in and what we've talked about is that a multimodal approach the combination of drug and non-drug therapies is the most mm -hmm. effective approach so i'm just talking about what one little space here but this is really exciting probably the most important advance in chronic pain management in humans or animals for 25 years is the advent of anti-nerve growth factor monoclonal antibodies and so there's been there are development programs for humans that are reaching their conclusion and the first anti-ngf nerve growth factor anti-ngf monoclonal antibody was recently um had a positive opinion which means it's it's a it's it's being approved in europe for the treatment of dogs with chronic pain osteoarthritis pain so this mm -hmm. is a an injection so one positive thing is that it's an injection so we're moving away from that the burden of everyday oral administration the next positive thing is it's a different mechanism of action um, mm. and unlikely to have any negative effects on the liver the kidneys the gastrointestinal tract um, and another positive thing is it's going because it's an injection that lasts probably at least four weeks maybe longer than that four to six weeks you're looking at continuous pain relief Mm. which which I know from all my research gives greater benefit instead of a kind of almost like a fire brigade approach. You know, when things are really bad, give a bit of medication, then stop, wait for things to be really bad again. So really, really exciting development. And it's, um, it's even more exciting because veterinary medicine has got the first anti-NGF monoclonal antibody before human medicine. And these these antibodies, so they, you know, I've referred to them as drugs, but they actually should be called biologics. They're made up of little amino acids and they're broken down in the body um, into the components. Uh, so these are these are not these are not drugs. They are biologics. They're little little small proteins, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. So. Something I want to because I'm really new to this and I'm hoping I'm going to get my hands on the literature to spend a day just kind of waiting for it. Is it going to be a first line? Is it the, something that, well, let's go back to our young dog. Yeah. And we've got a 18 month old golden retriever. He's got a terrible hip wiggle, you know. Is it going to be for that category or are we pushing more progressed? Is it all across the board? Yeah, no, so I, I was lucky enough a number of years ago, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago to be. Oh, your sound's gone off. Oh, it's back, it's back, good. With, so I was lucky okay. enough five or six years ago to be doing some of the first clinical trials with these anti-NGF monoclonal antibodies. And the efficacy was pretty obvious um, across different stages of osteoarthritis pain. So for me, it's absolutely going to be a first line choice, right. non steroidals okay. or anti NGF monoclonal antibodies. Um, and I'm sure as they as they come on the market, you know, we as a profession will learn the nuances of when to use one over the other. Um, the only the the area I'm going to be more cautious in is the very young dog, so maybe less than a year, just because yeah. nerve growth factor in the developing animal has beneficial effects mm. for the development of the nervous system. So, you know, until we have more information about those younger animals and the long-term effects of an anti-NGF, um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna be using it in dogs 12 months and above, but absolutely first line choice. 
Amazing. Okay, so then the next, it's quite common for a um, chronic pain practitioner, for a first line vet to think non steroids are our, our first line currently, or pit prints, first line. And then we add our adjuncts. Is right. it going to be the monoclonal antibodies, the first line, and the end stage becomes the adjunct? And then the, um, is that, is that <laughs> that's a good, that's a good question. <laughs> It's a good question, and I, I honestly don't know the answer, and, th mm. and I'll explain why in a moment. I think either are very appropriate first lines, and we are going to learn what is appropriate to add on to the anti-NGF. In human medicine, in human medicine, um, in, the, in the development programs, they saw a signal of what's being called rapidly progressing osteoarthritis in patients that had high levels of anti-NGF or high levels of anti-NGF plus a non-steroidal, right. okay? So in humans, with that particular biologic, which is totally different to, I, 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 I should have said, these biologics need to be species specific. So the human anti-NGF is humanized. It's, it's human, it's a human protein. Mm -hmm. The canine anti-NGF is caninized, not canonized, mm -hmm. caninized, and it's, it's canine. So it has to be recognized as self by, by dogs. So they're, they're, they're very different biologics, but on, with the human um, anti-NGF biologics, there was this signal of rapid progressing OA. No one really understands quite why, but it yeah. has made people feel very cautious about the concurrent use of an anti-NGF monoclonal antibody and a non straudal anti-inflammatory. Right. So we'll, we'll see what, what data are produced in veterinary medicine um, and I think, you know, that's going to be an active area of research and developing our understanding of whether we can use those two together. So yeah. to go back to your question, um, you know, both non steroidals and anti-NGF, very appropriate first line in my mind. Um, we know what to add on with the non steroidals We're going to, I'm sure things like gabapentin, and amantadine, um, in terms of drug therapy, very appropriate with an anti-NGF, but whether or not we can add on the non steroidals remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Well, that said, that said, just 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 very quickly, rapidly progressing osteoarthritis has never been described in dogs, so it's not even no. a recognised entity. So it's it, 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 it gets, just it gets to complex. Show you, like, um, wildfire chat and rumour is amazing in in non vet and vet because I can remember one of my friends saying, "Oh, well, the arthritis progresses behind the scenes, so I just don't know what you know. We're just masking it." And I'm like, I don't think that that's going to happen. I don't think it will come to market if we're allowing arthritis to rapidly progress behind no, the scenes. No, that's, that's no, totally untrue. <laughs> totally untrue. And, and also just very briefly, we're not going to get into the details, but pain per se, the presence of pain that's left untreated probably causes osteoarthritis to progress more quickly. Just the very presence of pain. <laughs> we're going to say that for next time. Okay. I think I know where you're going with this, but this this just, uh, I'm still a student. I love it. I love it. I get really excited going, I think I know what you're talking about. But anyway, we're going to say that for next time. Um, there will be a next time because when it is when? out, okay, I'm going to persuade you to come back and we'll talk about it in detail and focus the whole lot about it because there'll be loads and loads of questions. Okay, so final question. Where do you, the where does the future, what does it look like for you? Because... When I first heard about you and I started reading stuff that you're up to, I, I, you were one of the first people that I felt really was talking about the young dogs and it was like a massive mind right. So where, what does the future look like for you? And I don't know whether you're going to be talking more about more screening and more understanding of like the, the genetics behind it and trying to influence better breeding strategies or are we going to be focusing on better drugs that we can use? What's, what's your future look like for OA? Yeah, I think my 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 future, the future that I'm excited about, the near future, really for me lies in three areas. We're going to be talking a lot more about the fact that arthritis in dogs is a young dog disease. Uh, we're going to develop tools for owners, for veterinarians to recognize it in younger mm -hmm. dogs. And with that, have recommendations about effective, safe treatment at that stage in their life. So that's that is going to be exciting. Why is it exciting? Because it's going to improve the lives of these, these dogs. Mm -hmm. The second area that I think is really exciting is we are going to see a number of good analgesics being developed over the next few years. We've talked about the anti-NGF 
Um, what, another one of my favorites uh, are things like capsaicin, toxin for local treatment in joints. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's that's a really hot area, very exciting. The final area for me that is is exciting is um, technology is going to allow us to both diagnose OA earlier, OA pain earlier, and mm -hmm. monitor the efficacy of treatment. Um, yes. And I'm talking about technology that basically takes what we can do already, um, combines large volumes of data, applies artificial intelligence to it, and produces algorithms where we can we can detect the impact of OA pain much, much mm. earlier, and we can accurately understand the influence and the efficacy of treatments without having to rely on that those subjective assessments. I love that. And that is when people will start looking at the environmental impact of pain, because that is the technology that I believe will start showing about modifying your house, modifying your lifestyle. Look what it has achieved over this time with your dog. Yeah. That's what I'm really excited about. God, God, God. Um, that's amazing. I can imagine everybody has been blown away with this bit live, like the last one. Please go and dig out Duncan LaSalle's. You can go to our YouTube channel. And we have all of these presented in a library format on our YouTube channel, or you can scroll back on Facebook or even look in our little video channel on Facebook. All of these are free of charge. So guys, the guests that we have give up their time for free because like me, they really care about this disease and helping you get it right. Get fact, not fiction. So please do spread the word that we have this library that you can send your friends, your family, your colleagues to, and they can go and watch all of these again because it's straight from the horse's mouth. This guy does the research. So it's not being bent and adapted for selling purposes. And full kudos to you, Hannah, for, for taking what, <laughs> what some of us create, the information we create, and actually putting it into a practical context and helping it to get out there. So really appreciate it. And yeah, I'll just- well, I, I do enjoy it. And I think um, I, I, I was in so much emotional pain when I lost my dog. You know, it's, it's a way to help people because it is a really, really hard thing to look after a dog with OA. Yeah. So, thank you so much for joining us. We're not going to do 10 top tips today because we've been talking for so long. Um, say your thank yous because then I can get Duncan to come back again. We're going to persuade him to come back and talk about monoclonal antibodies. And I'd like you to come back and talk about the technology as well. If I'd love to. Yes. Yes. I would yeah, be I great. Can really get into that. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and I will say good night from me. Good night from him. I mean, a, a sort of a sort of two Ronnies type thing, which doesn't really work quite as well when your companion. I can tell that you're still English, though, doesn't yeah. it? You're, yeah. Even though you're in America, you still have that English side to you. Yeah. All right, cool. well, guys. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye.